How you doing? I'm doing really good. Doing really good. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks. Oh. It's great to be on the show. Yeah, we've had we have a ton of email questions for you. Um, you know, one of the things with with you, as long as uh, we've been watching wrestling, there's only been about a handful of guys that I think anyone has ever seen pick up wrestling so quickly. And I mean, do what do you? And, and most of them, as I started thinking of the names before the show, because I was thinking of uh, Jumbo Saru and Junakiyama in Japan, Owen Hart. Uh, was was quick, picked it up like really really quick, but that's almost deserves an asterisk because you know he was he probably started doing it when he was fourteen, but just didn't turn pro until he was older. Right. Um, and you know, but mo a lot of the names that that would be like that, like natural, you know, guys who come in and like just pick it up. A lot of them were good amateurs, and I read a quote from you once where you thought that the amateur background was not necessarily a help, or or do you think it was? No, I, I uh, to some extent it can be uh, to an aggressive approach, but uh, um. The way you're taught in a, a professional wrestling school uh, breaks every law that you are learned that you are taught when you're an amateur wrestler. So it's hard to break that law. But if you take the, pro the approach of everything you learned, do the opposite, then you're going to do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the thing I did. I I became a lot more passive instead of going in there and thinking I was going to kick everyone's butt. I let people kick my butt until I learned. And doing that, I picked up on it pretty quickly. I mean, it depends. You know, a lot of people have a great work ethic. So I have an outstanding work ethic. And uh, I pick up things very quickly because I always want to learn. I'm always willing to learn. Even, you know, even now I learn a thousand things every day in this, this uh, sports entertainment industry that, uh, you know, it, it amazes me. And that's uh, I've always had an open mind. And that's why I'm always trying to better myself every time I go out there. How did the uh, WWF approach you about uh, becoming a pro wrestler? And what did you think about it? Well, the WWF approached me in 1996, and at that point, I wasn't quite ready to um, to get into sports entertainment, only because a lot of people were um, against it that uh, were pretty much my peers. And uh, they just felt that it was the wrong direction for me being an Olympic gold medalist and and. You know, a lot of people don't understand the sports entertainment aspect that it's, you know, if anything, it's uh, basically someone that is an aspiring actor or is an actor that also does highly athletic things. And what better form of entertainment than that? that that's what I wanted to do. I just didn't know I wanted to do it at that point in time. So I turned them down and I started to watch wrestling, which I never did until 1998. And when I started watching it, that was the late summer, early fall of 1998, I realized how good of athletes these guys were. And uh, I called Vince McMahon and said, hey, I'd like to come up and try out. And he gave me the tryout. Now, what, were there any specific guys when you're talking about this where you did, that like stood out to you as you started watching it? Yeah, I think uh, obviously the, the, the top guy stood out dramatically, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, just because he was so aggressive. And he reminded me a lot of myself as an amateur wrestler. And uh, I was always considered a very aggressive wrestler that never let my opponents breathe. And uh, so I caught to him quickly, but then when I started to watch, I started to uh, take a liking to The Rock. I liked the way he approached everything, not just as an athlete, but everything else. I think that he has the gift. He's probably one of the most gifted guys out there in sports entertainment, if not the most gifted. And I started watching him, and I, I thought, you know what, I want to watch how this guy improves, how quickly, what he does, and I, I kept a close eye on him, and now here I am facing him, <laughs> you know, every other week, so it's uh, kind of ironic, but, um, you know, I learned a lot from him, and now I continue to learn from him because I get to work with him. One of the things, when you were when you worked in, when you were in Memphis, you did the classic... 1970s baby face character sure. and when you came when you came to the WWF it was almost a diametric opposite uh -huh. um I I mean what was there who 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 came up with the idea of being well, you know your character sort of based on being a 1970s baby face right. but in an obnoxious way I mean who came up with that character for you uh, Vince McMahon and the creative department came up with it because you know when I did the interviews up in in uh in Stanford, Connecticut at my camps, I always came off as like a sportscaster kind of guy. I always had a smile on my face, almost uh, too, too quote unquote cheesy, you know, and uh, so I think Vince started watching the tapes and he said, wow, this guy, this guy is something because he really, 
is uh, an Olympic gold medalist, and he really is uh, basically a goody two shoe, you know, and to a certain extent. So what he did is he took Kurt Angle and my ethics and the way I live, and he turned it up ten thousand notches. And now I'm shoving them down people's throats and and trying to preach to people how I live my life, and you know the three eyes, quote unquote, and uh, you know always telling them facts about different things about wrestlers or cities saying it's true and uh, so that's how I came up with that quote but I think what he did is he just saw a lot in me and he basically turned it up a thousand times and made created the character Kurt Angle uh, the, the real athlete or the most celebrated real athlete in the WWF did he come up with the three eyes too yes he did he said that uh, he looked at me and he and that's what he saw saw a man of intensity integrity and intelligence and uh and then he, he ran with it, and anything he told me to do, I did, and it seemed like everything worked out that way. So I'd have to say Vince McMahon really knows what he's doing. If he didn't, uh, he wouldn't be where he is today, but he definitely led me in the right direction. You know, one thing that I had heard about you that I wasn't aware of was um, when you were competing in, in, in college wrestling and you won the NCAA championships as a heavyweight, I think one of the shows Jim Ross actually brought it up, but I'd never heard the story, that you weighed 196. You weighed, you weighed 196 and won the heavyweight championship? 199, the lightest heavyweight ever uh, in NCAA history. Is there any reason why you went in at 199 and didn't go down to like the 190s? Because, you know, most of the guys... Most <laughs> you know of the why? guys Because I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that year, heavyweight was a much more competitive weight class, too. But, uh, you know, I started out the year at 222. And if you've ever been in amateur wrestling practice, you'll you'll realize uh, how quickly you can lose weight, especially if uh, if your appetite isn't up and uh, and you're stressing out. Getting toward the end of the year, you start to lose. You know, the guys in the upper weight start to lose 10 to 15 pounds of weight that they normally don't want to lose. A lot of guys will come into the NCAA's on weight, and usually they're lo cutting 10 or 15 pounds for to prepare for a tournament. That's just stress coming into the NCAAs, and that's what happened to me. So I found myself the last day. Of course, I went through the tournament. I think I was 203, then I was 201 the next day, and then I was 199 the last day, and I just couldn't believe it. It amazed me. I was under 200 pounds. But to be able to win the NCAAs, especially wrestling guys like um, Sylvester Turkey, who the WWF signed this year, uh, he's a big guy. He's about 6'7", 330, and uh, he was quite... He was quite an impressive wrestler, and to beat guys like him uh, really amazed myself. So, um, you know, I owe a lot to my coaches and, and just the way I approached the game, and that was that I worked harder than anybody else, and I prepared more. And that's how I am in sports entertainment, and that's probably why I'm improving pretty quickly here. But, um, you know, I just don't want to slow it down. I want to continue to do that. And didn't you suffer, like, a broken neck during the uh, Olympic final? Well, what happened was uh, at the U.S. Open right before the Olympics, about three and a half months before the Olympic Games, I got thrown directly on my head. And uh, so I, I finished that match where I barely won, and then I had to wrestle in the finals that night, and I couldn't do anything in the finals. It was the, basically a push-and-shove match where I just tried to uh, be more aggressive. I was just basically pushing the guy around the mat digging underhooks so that the ref would call him for stalling and uh, I barely won that 0-0 zero, zero referee's decision so I went home and I couldn't do anything what happened is I broke my neck and uh, and I also uh, herniated two discs in my neck and uh, the doctor said I wouldn't wrestle anymore so I went to get a second opinion uh, because I still had the Olympic trials in the Olympics and I knew that was the last two tournaments that I'd ever wrestle in if I could win them so I went to another doctor. He denied it, and then I went to a third, and he gave me permission as long as I showed improvement over the next two months. But we weren't seeing any improvement, so what he did was uh, he would go to my practices, and he would shoot Novocaine into each side of my neck, and he would... Um, basically watch me wrestle and make sure I didn't do anything stupid and I'd go half speed just to see how it would feel and uh, I, you know I don't condone that for anyone to have to shoot Novocaine into your neck but cortisone was illegal at that point at the, you know before the Olympic Games so here I am uh, shooting Novocaine in my neck just so I could wrestle and I did that throughout the trials and I end up winning the trials but uh, uh you know, if I could do it all over again, I probably would do the same thing. But it's just that when you get to that point, that level, uh, you don't want to give it up. And, you know, if it were any other level, if it was college level or high school level, I would have quit right there. But this was my last shot, and I wanted to make sure I went out a winner. So here I was 
doing that stuff, and and uh, I ended up winning the Olympic Games that way, which is kind of ironic. Now, did you did you when did you make a decision that you know you were wrestling through 1996 and only through 1996? Because you know a lot of guys, you know, I mean there there's some guys in their in their mid 30s. In fact, sure. I saw. There was, I think, isn't there, isn't there a guy who's trying to make a comeback? Um, oh, yeah, I, re I retired at, at one of the youngest ages that anyone's... Uh, I was 26, so, you know, I, I still had two more Olympic Games in me if I really wanted to do it, but that's not what I wanted to do. I'm, I am where I want to be, and that's uh, in the WWF. I just didn't realize it then. Um, you know, I, 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 it's really hard as an Olympic wrestler or any world-class athlete, you know, you only get one opportunity every four years to make an impact worldwide. And, uh, of course, you have the world championships in between, but you hardly hear about them. And so, you know, it was really important to me. All that pressure is a lot different than being in a professional sport because you can, you know, you can have a bad week and come back the next week and, and show that you're, you know, a, a great athlete or you end up losing a game and winning a game. At the Olympics, you have one shot, and that's it. So um, I knew I wanted to do it then, and once I won, that's when I realized I would retire. Until the referee raised my hand in the finals and I became Olympic champion, uh, if that did not happen, if I would have played second or lower, I would have been wrestling still in the 2000 Olympic Games. You know, you were talking about going to that, that Olympic trials, at 220, as I recall, there are a couple of names that, that a lot of listeners would know, and one name that I don't think that they they would know that were all in that trials with you were in there with uh, what uh, Mark Coleman, Mark Kerr, Dan Shade. Oh yeah, you know. So uh, we had one I mean, of the I, toughest weight classes, no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, going in there with like uh, a neck injury. I mean, those were was was the, was the trials any hard? What was what was harder, the trials the, or the Olympics? Uh, you know what? That's a hard question because um, at 220 pounds worldwide, it's one of the most competitive weight classes. Normally, 220 pounds na nationally is probably you know fifth or sixth most competitive. But at that particular time in 1996, it was one of the top weight classes because we had a lot of studs in there. You know, if you watch the Ultimate Fighting or anything like that, you see Mark Coleman and Mark Kerr uh, completely dominating, and uh, we had a lot of guys like that. Dan Shade, uh, he was an outstanding wrestler. Uh, he was a three-time Olympic alternate. The guy had some bad luck because three Olympics in a row, he ended up second. Uh, you had guys like young guys like Kerry McCoy and and uh, you know just upcoming superstars that you're going to see in the future. So um, it was a really tough weight class. Uh, Kirk Tros was a world uh, medalist, and uh, so I had to prepare for every single one of those guys. But I, I have to say, when Russia broke up uh, in 1992, you didn't only have one. Russian in your weight class at the Olympics, you had 16 of them because they all went to different countries and, and represented different countries. And that's the toughest nation in the world for wrestling, especially for the upper weights because Russians are normally big people. And uh, so I don't know which one would be tougher. Uh, I think because I wrestle the Americans all the time, it would be a lot harder to make the team because they know my style a lot more than the foreign, you know, the foreign competition. But that's probably the only reason why it'd be tougher. Uh, what do you think about, uh, do you follow Amateur, and what do you think about Brock Lesnar and uh, Brock Lesnar signing with the WWF? I think Brock can bring a lot to the table. I, I really don't know how he's going to produce in the WWF. Uh, he has a great look. I heard he's a phenomenal athlete, so I think he could have a big future, but you know as well as I do, you can't just be a good athlete. There's a lot of that you have to bring to the table to be a success in the WWF. Uh, all I can say is we'll sit and see how he produces. If he can produce like his buddy uh, Shelton Benjamin in Louisville, then we have a winner. Uh, I heard Shelton's doing an outstanding job down there, and you'll probably see him sooner than later. And uh, I think Brock Lesnar has a lot of potential, but that's up to him, and I hope that he makes the right decisions uh, to make it happen because I'd love to work with a guy here in the WWF. How is it, you know, whether it be uh, for for an, an amateur wrestling superstar or an ultimate fight competitor, or someone who's used to uh, being in, in, in an environment where, you know, you know, like on the ego, where, um, you know, how is it to give up the ego in the fact that, like, you know, you work sure. so hard not to lose, and then all of a sudden some guys coming up. To, I mean, you know, because some guys mentally can't handle being okay. Tonight you lose. And other guys, you know, I think can just look at it and just go, it's it's entertainment, and it's not it's not really even an aspect right. of it. Well, you know what? That's where you that's where you split reality from fantasy. And I'm not going to lie to you. There are guys in the WWF that really think they're their character. And you know that's that's a problem. The thing is, 
uh, you know, I am my character, but hey, that's okay. What I found out in the WWF is the guys that were the best athletes, we're talking at a, a you know college level, Olympic level, professional level, they're the guys that have have worked as a team with other people and, and have that team concept, they seem like they're the guys that are willing to accept taking the loss a lot more. And that's what uh, I don't understand because a lot of people would be upset with losing. Uh, me, on the other hand, I really don't care. As long as I put on a great performance, that's all I care about. And it's just kind of funny to see some of the guys that um, that actually, you know, they, they, they don't... <laughs> They're not. They don't want to accept the loss, especially if they lose um, fair and square. You know, if there wasn't a cheat involved or somebody doing a run in or or a distraction, and it just amazes me that um, anybody would be like that. But I do have to say, in the most part, the WWF, the guys there working together, uh, have been really good. I just heard some rumors in the past where it's, you know, it's kind of hard to understand that you know these guys can't separate that, and it, it amazes me. Uh, Do you ever think about doing no holds barred fighting? Back before you got in the WWF? The Ultimate Fighting? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been approached many times by the Ultimate Fighting. Uh, if I were to do something like that, I would not be living in Pittsburgh. I probably would have moved down to uh, uh, San Diego, California to train with Kenny Shamrock. And uh, Kenny was trying to recruit me for a long time. Uh, that's one thing about the Ultimate Fighting. I would never go in there with just amateur wrestling skills. I don't think... And, you know, very few people have been able to pull it off where they can win the ultimate fighting just on amateur wrestling alone. I think uh, Danny Severn might have done it once. Uh, Mark, Mark Coleman has done it before he started to uh, open up his uh, repertoire of technique. You know, that's the one thing about Ken Shamrock and what makes him so effective is he is so well-rounded at all disciplines. And that's the way I would take the approach, too, if I were to do it. And I'd have to go to a school like Kenny Shamrock's. Uh, let's let's start get, taking some phone calls. We'll start with Rob in Connecticut. You're first up with Kurt Angle. Hey Kurt. Hey Dave. Hey, how, hey, you, how doing? you doing? I just had a quick uh, two quick questions for Kurt. Are you uh, surprised or like amazed on um, uh, how fast your character is caught on with the fans? Am I surprised on how fast the character is caught on? Is yeah, that, with is the that heat you that you get. Um, yeah, I, I really am. I, I thought it would take a lot more time. I know I've worked my butt off to, to make it happen, but um, I also know that the fans here in the WWF, uh, they're not the easiest fans to fool. I mean, you have to have real um, talent to uh, for them to appreciate it. And I remember Jim Ross, when I joined, I was asking him. I didn't really understand the business at the time. I said, hey, Jim, how long is it going to take me to get on TV? A month, two months? He said, Kurt, you'll go on TV when you're ready. And it, I, I swear, the year, it took me a year, but I, I swear it felt like five years. And I'm glad that he waited, because if I would have went on any sooner, I might have made a fool out of myself. And, uh, you know, for an Olympic champion uh, athlete to go into the WWF and make a fool out of himself, and I've seen guys do it, and I'm not going to say any names, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you don't want that to happen, because the fans aren't forgiving. And uh, and if, if you're in that situation, it'll be hard as heck to bail yourself out. So I'm glad they took their time with me. I have one more question. Um, with uh, you crossing the uh, handshaking line with Stephanie on Monday, is that going to lead to anything with you and Triple H down the road? I believe so. I think something's going to happen. Um, I think it's going to be a point where she's going to have to choose. And uh, that's not that might just be me talking, but um, I, I think the fans can expect something like that to happen in the future. And uh, uh, I think it's just the direction they want to go with my character. You know, it's it's. I'm at a point now where I've done so much as this one-dimensional. I don't want to say one-dimensional, but. Um, you know, you always want to change, and you always want to come up with different directions. And I think they they're starting to come up with another direction for me. And I I expect big things at King of the Ring, and a lot of bigger things afterwards. So I think uh, we're all in the uh, you know we're all thinking the same thing. And and Vince McMahon has done nothing but great things for me, and I expect any nothing less than that in the future. So I'm pretty excited about it. All right, thanks, Locker. Thank you. Come right. okay. promo to you, right? Wait, go, go, go ahead, Brian. Brian. How much of the um, intros do you write, your speeches before your match? Uh, who helps me write them? Yeah. And how, uh, how much do you do yourself also? Um, you know what? It, it, 
I'd say it's a, it's a little bit of everybody. Vince McMahon definitely comes up with some good stuff. I have a writer there, Brian. Uh, I can't even remember his last name, but him and I, believe it or not, Brian's a very good friend of mine. I can't even remember his last name, but I know him as Brian. Uh, he comes up with a lot of great ideas, a lot of great concepts, and we sit down and I throw in my two cents worth, and then we both go to Vince McMahon, and Vince uh, finalizes it. And Vince always changes it around just a little bit to make it more effective. So uh, it's kind of a team thing, but you, you want to be involved in, the, in what you're going to say because you're saying it. Uh, if you let someone else write everything, uh, you're not going to be completely comfortable with what you're saying. And, and uh, I think that's really important is to stay highly involved in, in your character and portraying your character and trying to evolve that character. And that's what I try to do. I'm always, I call Brian on the week, during the week to find out uh, what could possibly happen the next week so I have something in my mind that I'd like to say. So uh, I'd say it's a team thing, but Vince McMahon definitely has a big impact on that. I, before we before we go on, I just got this email that I had to read. Uh, this has nothing to do with Kurt Angle, but it says, "Did you?" I guess last night on Thunder, and I missed this, Brian. It said there was a sign in the front row that said, "Blur this sign, WCW." <laughs> I didn't see that. Oh my God! What did it say? Blur, because because a lot of times on WCW, especially on the tape shows, oh, they uh, digitize <laughs> they digitize a lot of signs because I, either they either they got bad language or they have messages that they don't want on television. So there's a sign that goes, "Blur this sign, WCW." And they didn't <laughs> they didn't blur it. <laughs> oh right. man, that is great. Now, when when, when who uh, who came up with this, the concepts as far as like some of the stuff like uh, when you did that stuff at uh, the college with the, I think it was Penn State for the abstinence and uh -huh. and that type, that that aspect of the gimmick. Brian and Vince uh, both together came up with that, and I'm not sure what they want to do with that. I think it, it had to do with my character being so clean cut. And really, if you, if you watch my matches and the things I do, uh, I'm not always such a clean cut guy. I mean, I'll win any way I can. So here I am, I'm preaching one way, and sometimes I'll go the other. So, you know, my character's unpredictable in one way. But um, he threw in the abstinence because... You know, athletes, let's face it, we were, we were always told all our lives to to not, you know, to stay abstinent or don't have sex before your events. So what they did is they blew that up, too, and said, okay, this guy has never had sex. That's why he won the Olympics. Okay, that's why he won two belts in the WWF, because he will not have sex. And so, you know, that, that's what we're doing. We're basically making fun of athletes from the past uh, having this concept that, that sex is bad and, you know, women weak in legs, if you remember Rocky. So um, I remember that story. When you were in college, by the way, when you were in college, did you actually get that from coaches and stuff? Because I remember when I was always, in college. Always. When I was in, when I was in college, you know, one of my I, 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 we had a very good wrestling team, and uh, one of my good friends was going to the NCAA tournament. And I mean, the coaches banned him from seeing his girlfriend before right, that tournament. Right. You know, it's all theory, and it, it cracks me <laughs> up because it's so untrue. But uh, <laughs> but um, you know, that, that's what we were doing. We we're basically making fun of athletes for for being like that. And and now here I am. I, I did it one time, and we had to run with it because it was so funny. So I, I'm I'm the man of three eyes and a big A. <laughs> and uh, now, now, who knows now, where I'm going to go next? You never know. A year from now, I'll probably be in a bar drinking with Bradshaw and, you know, <laughs> just saying the three I suck. <laughs> I loved, I, you know what, I, you know, one, one skit that I loved was, uh, um, it was when, uh, you were trying to get back. I think it was at the Acolytes, and you went to the boss man, and the boss man started talking about you know that angle of the big show. I dragged his daddy and all this, and then you just like I looked at him, and go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like in shock, like this guy is crazy. Yeah, you know what? I have a lot of fun doing the vignettes. I think that's my best work, and it's because Brian and I come up with some great concepts where where we make my character seem so off the wall. Where you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll even do like a normal vignette, and at the end I'll say something and completely out of the blue that means nothing. And it's just like, wow, this guy is a complete idiot. But, um, <laughs> you know, like the other night I was talking to uh, Edge and Christian, and I basically said, hey, if, if we, if we uh, win this match tonight, we had like a six-man tag. I said, if we win this match tonight, there's no doubt in my mind. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I said, we will win uh, the honor of, you know, we, we will defend the honor of Stephanie McMahon-Helmsley. And they were like, so what? I could do that. <laughs> and maybe 
she'll be in a good enough mood to give you guys another tag team shot. So they got all excited, and we were getting ready to walk away. And I said, you know, I, I beat Bradshaw last week. You know, just out of nowhere, because <laughs> it's so important for me to win, no matter if I get my butt kicked or not, as long as I win, you know, that's all that matters. Like when I got choked out against Taz at the pay-per-view, I, you know, I, I woke up. I said, did I win or did I lose? That's my first thing. It's not that I get my ass kicked or, you know, it's, and they said it was a, that he choked me. I said, that's illegal. I won, right? And it's like I got embarrassed on TV, but as long as I won, that's all that mattered. And it's funny because that's how athletes really are. <laughs> I, got, I, got a, I got a question. You, you, now you have a couple of, uh, you, have, you have like a brother and like a nephew that were in the NCAAs in the last couple of years? Yeah. Who, who are the family members? He's, He's a three time okay. All American. He went to Clarion and he was ranked first in the nation his last two years. But uh his junior year he lost in the semifinals against the guy he beat at the all star match. He got caught behind and he tried to catch up. He ended up third that year and uh it was very upsetting to him and then this year he hurt his knee about three weeks before the nationals and he went out there and just did his best and ended up fourth. So he had some bad luck, but uh he he is a much better wrestler than I ever was. Uh I just uh stayed healthy. Uh, I, I was a, a little bit better of an athlete, you know, as a natural athlete. But as a wrestler, he had all the tools. And uh, it's a shame not to see someone like him win a national title. Is he interested in pro? And also, what is the reaction that you've gotten now that you're actually a pro wrestling? It's in, in, instead of just going into pro wrestling uh, when you first started, but now that you're pretty much of a success in pro wrestling, what are... What's the reaction of some of the guys that you competed against? Are they like a lot? Are they a lot more? You know, like uh, they see it a lot easier now than maybe when you first started. And it was some Definitely. people might have thought you were selling out or whatever the term would be. Definitely, I think a lot of people were a little bit upset, but after watching me on TV and getting to know what it's all about, uh, because I didn't understand it at the beginning either. Um, they're happy for me, and they're happy that here I am. Whether I say I'm a wrestler or not, people know I won the Olympics in amateur wrestling. I'm promoting my sport every single time I go out there. And you know amateur wrestling uh, does not get much exposure. So me being in there really helps our sport, whether people like it or not. That's just the way it is. If some pro football player comes in and does, uh, uh, and does something for the WWF or the other federation, obviously he's given his football league exposure and that's that's what i'm doing to wrestling and hopefully uh if you notice we're starting to sign a lot of amateur wrestlers so i yeah. think they they thought you know we caught on big with kurt angle let's see if we can get a couple more shooters in here um get it get it get the ball rolling that has a lot to do with jerry briscoe because he was a former amateur wrestler and he loves amateur wrestlers so we're you might see a lot more in the future and and uh, you know anybody that's a, an, aspiring to be a pro wrestler amateur wrestling is definitely a way to go uh if you want to learn just the pro wrestling tactics uh you know you don't want to be an amateur wrestler but you know it, it really shows you how to protect yourself in many ways and i think that's really important is uh when you come into the wwf or any other federation if you're an amateur wrestler these guys for one won't take advantage of you because they know that you can protect yourself and uh they also know that you're going to be a pretty damn tough guy and as long as you pick it up and, and you do what you're told, uh, you're going to have a lot of respect. And, uh, and that's what the guys, I've been really nice to the guys, and the guys have been nice to me, and I've gotten a lot of respect throughout the Federation. I think it's because of my accomplishments in my particular sport. Do you think that, that as far as, like, from the mental approach, that amateur wrestling may have been real beneficial in as far as, like, in it, in it, you know, to be an amateur wrestler at the level that you were, mm -hmm. you've got to be exceedingly mentally tough, and yeah. you know, like you know, and not a crybaby, and not you know, you know, you know, or else you know, you're just not going to make it to that level. And in pro, it's 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 a good trait to have because you're you know, you're traveling to 18, 20 cities a month. Sure. It's, it can be real hard, and if you let it be, I mean, it is real hard. It, you know what? It is hard, but it's not a problem to me because you're right. I did a lot of traveling. I traveled ten months a year, amateur wrestling, trained eight hours every single day, so. I know what it feels like to to be like this, you know, where it's long, grueling, exhausting schedule, and uh, I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed that. As long as I'm working hard and I'm keeping myself busy, uh, that's when I'm happiest. And uh, you know, so I do owe a lot to amateur wrestling. The reason why I'm uh, doing so well in professional wrestling definitely has to do with my mental approach and my mental and physical toughness. You're, there's no doubt about that. And wrestling gave me that. Amateur wrestling, no doubt. We'll start with Adam in Brooklyn. Oh, hey, Kurt. I'm a big fan. I have uh, two questions for you. Sure. One's easy and one's a little bit harder. Um, I was looking at WrestleWire.com, and they had some, like, you know, King of the Ring, uh, whoever, you know, who's in it. I was wondering, um, who are you facing in the next round, if you know? 
Um, I don't have any idea. I think right now, are we in the final 16? Yeah. That's what we were just doing. We were doing that yesterday. I think so. <laughs> I don't even know. Heck, I beat Bradshaw, though. Did you know that? <laughs> after, tonight, after tonight's SmackDown, it goes. it's the final eight. So everyone who survived, so so we're really in the final eight right now. Okay, so basically, Kurt Angle got a bye last round and didn't know it. <laughs> Wait, dude, now what happened? Then what happened? No, you beat Bradshaw. I beat Bradshaw in the first round. Okay. And I haven't wrestled since. Oh well, you should probably wrestle at some point. <laughs> I, I wrestled in a six-man tag, and then I uh, let's see. After that, I wrestled. I I had a stack of people sending me stuff where he had it all figured out, and then I threw it away. <laughs> I, I don't know who I wrestled. I, I, I might have I, uh, wrestled somebody. We hey, need I think I know what's going on here. We need bracketing real bad. Well, tonight's show is the last two matches of the round of 32. And then on Heat, the first two matches of the round of 16 start. Right. Okay, that makes right, sense. right, right. Okay, okay. That's right. Yeah, okay. so yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we would, we'd be in, in the final... Right, okay, it's the final eight matches, but it's the final 16 okay, that starts... Okay, so we're still in the 16, right? Right, and, and the matches that start this coming Sunday that were taped on Tuesday would be the first matches of the round of with, of the, of the round of 16, okay. Okay, so I will have a match uh, this Monday for the 16. I'm not sure against two, but um, I do know that, uh, you know, as the rounds... Uh, in, uh, get later and later. You're going to see a lot of surprises. Okay. And, and I have I think, uh, this is my uh, you know, You're not going to see the typical um, format or, or the final four that you would normally see, and I think that's going to be really interesting. You'll like it. Hmm. I can promise you that. I just don't know who yet. I'm not going to tell you who, but I can promise you you'll, you'll like it. Okay. This is my uh, harder question. I was wondering, like, you went to uh, ECW in 1996, like, inquiring about work, or I read that someplace. And he, I, he, was at a, he was at a show doing like a commentating appearance. Yeah, and I, yeah, it was um, when uh, I don't know, it was like Taz match, I think. But I was wondering what happened there because I heard it was something about the crucifixion angle they did with Sandman and Raven. And what oh, was the whole yeah. deal about that? Well, actually, um, you know, it, of course, the ECW is a little more hardcore, and I went to the event. Uh, they were basically promoting it as a more legitimate form of wrestling. Ba basically, what they told me, and this, this was in, I think, in late 1996, maybe early 97, they, they told me that it was more my kind of wrestling. Okay, they didn't tell me what it was. I never watched pro wrestling, so you, so you have to understand, when I got there, I was a little bit surprised. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I watched the first match, I was like, oh, my God. So they told me that I would uh, commentate Taz's match with, I think, uh, 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 an Italian kid. I can't remember Guido. his name. Guido? Guido. Yeah. Jeez, why can't I remember that? And uh, actually, they did a little bit of amateur wrestling at the beginning, so I commentated the match. And basically, that's all I had to do. And, and I, wa I started watching the rest of the match. And, you know, me being an uh, Olympic champion that year, I, I did a lot of speaking to kids and, and uh, a lot of inspirational speech speaking, uh, did, did a lot of uh, speeches for um, uh, churches and stuff like that, and not that, it doesn't really matter what people do, it's just the fact that, you know, I went, they misled me, and when I got there, they told me they wouldn't do anything unethical that would uh, offend, uh, you know, what I was doing, and, and he knew, you know, which direction I was going at that particular time, so Polly didn't, wasn't really honest with me, and what happened is... Here I was watching, uh, I think it was Raven putting Sandman up on a cross where Sandman's son was actually uh, telling Raven to do it, you know, and he was getting into it, and I was just, and there was blood everywhere, and, and that was fine. I mean, if that's a form of entertainment that people enjoy, but if you would have seen the reaction of the crowd, I mean, everybody was more in shock than they were entertained, and uh, everybody just kind of started looking at each other, and they were just like, oh, you know, geez. And I looked at Polly and I said, Polly, uh, you tell me this isn't going to be on TV right after I just commentated. And uh, Polly said, Kurt, I didn't know they were going to do it, whether he, he lied or not. He told me they didn't know they were going to do it. And he promised me it wouldn't be on TV, it would be on videotape. That was fine with me. But um, 
He, the problem was, I don't care what they do. Uh, they can do anything they want to do. They can put whoever on a cross. You know, I don't. It, it might offend me, but it might not offend other people. And that's that's the one thing I've learned about sports entertainment. There's something for everyone. But the thing is, Paulie wasn't honest with me, and that's the problem I had. So I told him if it aired on TV at the same time that I aired, that he'd probably be hearing from my attorney. So, you know, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm some, you know, idiot jerk that, that uh, you know, won't let Polly do what he wants to do. I'm just saying they weren't honest with me, and that's the problem I have with them, because I don't have a problem with whatever they want to do. I mean, this is a free country. You can do whatever you want. I was just a little bit offended that they would bring in an Olympic gold medalist that speaks to children for a living to, and have a little child helping someone put the guy up on the cross to crucify him. I just thought that was a little bit over edge. That never even made a uh, tape curtain. Yeah. <laughs> Did, did you did you have any kind of a problem as far as like when in the WWF um, when they did because they did some you know crucifixion angles a couple of times as well sure when Stone Cold and the Undertaker and stuff I uh, I don't have a problem with it you know uh, it, it obviously isn't something that that makes me want to watch it um, you know but it, it is entertainment uh, you're going to see it in movies you're going to see it uh, on television shows and basically what they're saying is this is no different than that and uh, so. You know, if it happens, it happens. Uh, that's cool. Um, if I had kids and I was watching it, I'd probably turn the channel until it was off, but I would definitely turn it back on. And I, I'm a big believer in parents making sure the kids don't see what they don't want them to see. And that's easy. That's why you have a remote control. And uh, I'm a big believer in that WWF is great for kids to watch because it's a form of entertainment that kids can get into. Uh, you can always, as long as you monitor your kids and tell them, hey, don't go to school and hit somebody over head with a chair. I mean, that's pretty stupid. What you're seeing on TV might not be all fake, but it's a form of entertainment for people to enjoy. It's not the, it's not to promote kids to go out and be violent. Uh, but like I said, you know, I think it's real important to, to show your kids certain things. You know, I love, I think, I think Stone Cold is a great, um, believe it or not, role model for kids because he shows uh, courage, you know, he shows uh, bravery. You know, so it's not like Stone Cold, this guy just breaks all the laws and, and kicks everyone's butt and he, and, and he doesn't listen to anyone. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, in a lot of ways, is a role model for kids. He might swear, that's not good, but he does stand up for himself when he has to. And, uh, you know, there are certain things that you can teach your kids. There are good things about people and there are bad things about people, and you want to teach your kids the good things about people. But no drinking and driving. <laughs> exactly. You know, Brian, he was seen, when he was talking about the ECW, could you imagine someone who actually had never seen pro wrestling? I mean, because I've watched pro wrestling my whole life, and the first time I went to ECW, it was like kind of, I didn't know it. <laughs> it's kind of different. <laughs> it was but a I different mean, kind of wrestling. It was an all-star cast that night. I, I was uh, impressed to, because I never watched it before, but... You know, years later, I'm like, wait a minute, I saw him at ECW. Oh, my God, I saw him. I mean, it was Mankind, Perry Saturn. There was uh, the Sandman, Raven, um, um, uh, Steve Williams. Uh, I could name a bunch of people. The Blue Meanie, uh, uh, Stevie, uh, Stevie Richards. Uh, I can I can go down a list of 20 that you would see in, in uh, exposed every week after week. I mean, it was an amazing uh, roster. That was actually... Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I said that was actually a really great show because they had, like, the Eliminators against, you know, Williams and Terry Gordy and stuff like that. Like, sure. It was, like, you know, really all-star kind of matches. But the thing that, you know, no one ever, no one ever saw most of them because they did that crucifixion angle, and then they were cutting the Christian, you know, you know, censors. Uh, they wouldn't let them, you know, put it on tape and sell it. They, they wouldn't put it on tape to sell it? Nope. And Raven, I'm surprised. Him, so he came out and apologized for the whole thing. You know what? They, I, I didn't think Raven should have done that. I, I don't really think that he had anything to apologize for. I mean, he was basically expressing himself and doing what he felt would entertain people. Um, nobody expected Raven to apologize, and that's the one thing a lot of people say. You know, Kurt, I can't believe you made Raven, Raven go out there and apologize. I didn't make him go out. I didn't even want him to. <laughs> that, was uh, that, was, that was Paul's doing. Okay, that was Paul's doing. I but, think um, Paul, the whole I think, point was, you I know, think Paul's, wasn't, Raven just did something that no one else has ever done. He went a little bit over edge, but um, that's what this is all about. Sports entertainment, we do a lot of things that are over the edge. So I don't think Raven thought it was offensive by any means, but Raven is Raven. You know, Kurt Angle's Kurt Angle. I would never do a, a crucifixion thing, or I would never think of it. But, you know, everyone's different. 
I, I think Paul's feeling was that, that as, as a Jewish owner of a company with a Jewish performer in, in, in Raven, that he didn't want it to, you know, he, he was afraid it would come Kinda out of the fun of a. Uh, yeah, like, it made, like he's making fun of another religion, so he just sure. figured that, that, he, that he felt that it would be better, and he just told him to go out there and apologize. And I think Raven was, it was a kind of half ass apology anyway. Yeah, he, oh, yeah, he, he, he didn't want to be there. There's no he didn't want to do that. it. Yeah, he didn't want to do it, so. Yeah, you know, he was almost better off not going out there, because he yeah. just showed everybody he, he didn't really give a heck. He was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I apologize, see you later. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that that's cool and everything. I mean, he just didn't feel like he needed to, but... um. Uh, you know, you're right, though. I think that if Polly, uh, that was definitely a, a good thing because if Polly, I didn't even know he was Jewish, but you're right, yeah. that, that would definitely come off to some people that, you know, here are these Jewish people are making fun of Christians, you know, and, uh, and that, that wouldn't, <laughs> that would be pretty bad on his part. So I think he was just trying to protect himself, too. Okay, let's go. Let's go to Dave in Pennsylvania. Dave, you're next up. Hello. Um, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of Kurt. Um, he went to Clarion. I went to Mansfield University. Just, do you know where that is, Kurt? Oh, yeah, Mansfield. That's on the other side of the state. Time? But uh, I see those guys at the PSCACs every year. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in the PSAC, yeah. Um, my friend was telling me once about how you pinned him, just obliterated him. And it was a funny story. Um, and uh, now I see you're doing so well. And I'm just a huge fan of your work. And I just, I just mark out you know, every time. Because you get the great promo. Then you get the excellent wrestling match, too. And um, you're like the real total package in, in my mind. So uh, I'm going to stop sounding like a mark here. And I just wanted to talk about how I really like the WWF, how it has so many great wrestlers and so much storyline potential. And just sitting here, I was going to ask you about the ECW thing, and that's already been asked. And another question kind of came to mind, and that's that I see, like, when Steve Austin comes back, and if he's able to get in shape, and I think he will because he... He has that work ethic and love for the business. Definitely. I think Steve Austin is going to make it back, and I think he's going to do great. And I think of all these feuds for Steve Austin. There's a, I think you could bring back Benoit, or you can bring Austin and have him feud with Benoit. Kind of like a reverse of the Bret Hart feud, where Benoit is playing the Austin role against Bret Hart, who is, and I mean, the Austin would be playing the Bret Hart role. is And say Benoit is the one dogging uh, Steve Austin in his return, like when Steve Austin dogged Bret Hart in his return. And uh, I think that could be a huge feud. I think there's a Triple H feud with Austin. And then and maybe at WrestleMania you could do an Austin heel turn and the Rock feud with him. That would be huge. But I think what would really set it off, uh, Steve Austin's return, is if you stayed heel and feuded with Steve Austin. Because I think your character, I mean, it's just the perfect match. Uh, the promos would just be amazing and the wrestling would be great. And I think it'd be really good at put, for putting you over. I'd like to know, um, first, there's two questions. First... If you've been, if that has been talked about with you, if, when Austin returns, whether you would be his first opponent or be in line to wrestle him. And secondly, if Raven was brought in, I think with your style of promos and your character, I think you could put Raven over huge as a babyface. Um, and I think eventually, just a quick comment, I think you could be, I could see you wrestling Triple H in the Stephanie feud, second from the top of the card at WrestleMania, if there is an Austin heel turn. And there's an Austin Rock match at the next WrestleMania. But I just want to know, have they talked about you? Have they talked with you about wrestling uh, Steve Austin on his return, having a quick feud with him, you know, like a two-month thing or a one-month thing? And um, <clears throat> would you be interested in working with Raven and uh, putting him over or working with him if, if he comes to the WWF in a month or two? Um, and that's about it. And uh, um, thanks for staying with me, Dave. Appreciate it. Okay. You know what? I could... I could barely hear him, but he said something about Stone Cold Steve Austin and me doing. Maybe I'd be able to put him over. Or... He was he was asking if you would. If, if, is there anyone's talked to you about uh, maybe wrestling Steve Austin when Steve Austin came? Does that mean? Does that mean that you would have to be the one who ran him over with that car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe it would be. <laughs> it messed his neck up. Um, you know what? I, I've always dreamed of working uh, with Stone Cold Steve Austin, and I do agree with him. I think that. Um, First of all, nobody has to put Stone Cold over. Stone Cold is over himself. Um, I think it would be a very, very exciting feud only because of our personality uh, um, contradictions. Um, you know, he could really make me look like a fool 
and 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 entertain the fans, and I could actually make myself look like a fool. I've done that many times, but um, I think that would be a really good mix, and I expect that to happen in the future. I think Stone Cold will be back. Um, he deserves to come back at the very top, and as long as he stays in the business, he'll always be at the very top. But um, it'd be an honor to work with him, and I think that we could definitely complement each other. As far as Raven, I think he said something about me working with Raven. Um, I have nothing against Raven. I, I would love to work with Raven. If he ever came to the WWF, he's a phenomenal worker. Uh, he's great on the stick. Um, I heard he's uh, you know he's very cooperative working with. Um, it, it would be a, an honor to work with him too. You know, I, I've never had a problem with him, and I think that he is uh, one of the best in the business himself. So, um, as far as putting him over, I don't think. I think it would be a good chemistry to work with them. I think that our characters would definitely contradict enough that it would be very interesting. But again, I wouldn't have to put him over. I think he'd be, you know, wherever he, whatever direction they put him or wherever he wanted to go, I think he could do him, do it himself. So, uh, uh, that, if that answers that question, I hope I did. As far as Triple H, I think he said something about Triple H to me at WrestleMania. Yeah, maybe he was thinking maybe like, uh, you know, you and Triple H rocking Austin is like maybe a double. A double main event that's getting way ahead of ourselves, but yeah, sure. it's a possibility too. Sure, um, that is getting way, way, way ahead of ourselves. Um, <laughs> you, you never know. As a matter of fact, uh, you know they have a direction. They could have a direction for the next eight months, but you know as well as I do, it can change tomorrow. So uh, there are no guesses. There are no um, uh, definites. It's just keep doing your work and hopefully uh you know you'll make yourself go in the right direction and they'll help you they'll lead you along the way uh i don't see it being in, in, impossible i think it being it's it's a possibility that you will see triple h and myself team up um but i think you're going to see triple h and myself go against each other before we team up and i think it has to do with the storyline Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia. Here's today's question. What was the main event of the highest-rated WWF television show of the modern era? And from modern era, let's say, 1984 to the present. That's, that's good modern, because I, I don't know about the TV ratings in the 50s, because I know that they were, they were huge. So <laughs> that's another era. Anyway, we're back here with uh, Kurt Angle, of course, myself and Brian Alvarez, and a full bank of phone calls. Um, before we get to the calls, um, this is a question from Andre R R Rinconio. Um, who is asking about the 1976, 1996, God, I don't want to make you old, 1996 <laughs> Olympic final uh, against the Iranian. Um, w he says, like, the match ended in a 1-1 tie, and uh -huh. then you won the decision. What was what was behind all that? Well, what happened is uh, we uh, tied 1-1 one -one in regulation. We went into overtime, and we tied in overtime. So it came down to a referee's decision. And they went with who made more aggressive moves throughout the match. And I don't, I'm not sure how they keep track of that. And to be honest with you, uh, I've watched the match a thousand times now, and I still can't pick a winner. But the thing is, I won the world championships the year before, so I was a reigning world champion. And I think what the judges had to do is decide which one. The match was so even, so dead even, that uh, they had to come up with a decision. And I think what they did is they went with the reigning world champion. That was me. So, you know, here we are tied one to one. And actually, at the very end of the match, I did take them down, and one ref awarded me a point that the other two did not. And if if one other ref official would have awarded that point, then they wouldn't have had to decide. It would have been two to one. So a lot of people feel that I did win two to one, and that might have been the um, uh, that might have been the factor in me winning that, and also being the reigning world champion. So uh, it was a very very tight match and. You know, when you have something like that, one guy can only be the winner, but I think both guys, we both put on a great match, and we both uh, both went out there to win. So, uh, you know, I give him a lot of credit, and you're going to see a lot of him in the 2000 games. Did you ever cross paths with Dan Severn, or was he just before your time? Uh, actually, Danny beat me uh, in 1988. Uh, I was a freshman in college. I was 18 years old, and I think Danny at the, that particular time, well, he's about 10 years older than me. So, he's uh, 12 years older than you. He's 12 years older than you. Oh wow! So yeah. you know, Danny, Danny had a lot more experience on me. He beat me one nothing, and I think at that point he was actually the reason that I thought that uh, I could be successful in international wrestling because this guy was considered one of the top 10 wrestlers. I'd say about. He was ranked about 10th in the world at the particular time. 
and here I went one nothing with them. So I realized that I did have the talent to go on to the next level because I was so young, and uh, it was that was about the only time I wrestled them though. So um, losing one nothing to Danny Severn at that particular time was really good, and Danny ended up retiring after that. Let's go to Chad in North Carolina. Chad, you're up with Kurt Angle. Hey guys, how's it going? Real good. Uh, hey Kurt, I was uh, I was going to ask you about the Taz thing, but I guess somebody else took that. Um, me and my brother met you in an autograph session. He wanted me to tell you um, to thank you for signing our stuff. Um, you know what? Could you repeat what he said? I'm having trouble. I mean, he, 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 okay, he just said that uh, that he, that him and his brother met you or uh, at an autograph session. He just wanted to thank you for uh, signing everything. Oh, sure, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming. That's mm -hmm. great. And um, who did you who do you think are the most underrated people in the WWE? Can you hear that? Who, who do I think are the most underrated people in the WWF? Yeah, underrated wrestlers in the WWF. Uh, you know what? Uh, I, the thing is, I'd have to say there are a lot of them, you know? Uh, you know, you look at guys like Chris Benoit. Chris is phenomenal. Um, he is, he's got a phenomenal uh, presence about him. He's a, even a better worker than he is, you know, than his presence. Uh you know, he is the Intercontinental Champion. There's not much higher he can go, but even Chris is underrated. So, I mean, where do we mark the rated and underrated? You know, which guys are underrated? Chris Benoit, I think, is one of the best in the business, and uh, he deserves the WWF Championship. So, you know, there are many guys. Uh, you know, I look at guys like Val Venus uh, that, you know, might have had that one character that kind of... It might have might have pushed him at the beginning, but it might have held him back just a little bit, you know, as he took the next step. So, I'd say a guy like Val Venus is is a guy that's a little bit underrated as well. Uh, D'Lo Brown, you talk about a phenomenal athlete. There's a there's an incredible athlete right there that uh, he weighs 285 pounds and he can do uh, spring moon salts and and just incredible things. So, um, there are a lot of guys out there, but I'd have to say that. Um, a lot of guys can be underrated. It's just a matter of uh, their time will come in the future. And, you know, I can't complain because I've been getting, I, I don't like to call it a, a push, but, you know, I've been getting, I've been taking the, the, the necessary steps to going to the WWF championship, you know, to winning the belt. So I can't say I'm underrated. I think I've been blessed with, a, you know, a lot of people helping me out. So, um uh, but I can't answer that question because, you know, who can you say is underrated? It, it, I think Chris Benoit could be the WWF champion right now, so I'd say he's underrated. Mm -hmm. And there are guys that are, you know, the beginning undercards that, that deserve to go the next step. It's just going to take a little bit more time. And a question for you, Dave. Um, which, sure. was, which, in your opinion, was more brutal, um, the Terry Funk versus Sabu, born to be wired, Matt, or the Foley Undertaker, um, Hell in the Cell? They're totally different. You know, I never saw I never saw except clips of the Terry Funk Sabu uh, barbed wire match. I mean, I seen the, the the clips of it and it looked. I mean, I, I I didn't really. You know, you know, I could say that like what I saw in the clips of it, I didn't like. And Undertaker, uh, Mick Foley, the Hell in the Cell. I mean, was was probably the um, the one match that's universally regarded as like a fantastic match. That that I mean, I, you know, I respect it uh, of what he was trying to do, but but I didn't like it because it scared me for what the business might turn into. Mm -hmm. I just thought that the, it was it was too dangerous. I mean, I, I you know, if if you do something where there's a risk of injury, or you're, you're you're doing high risk moves, it's one thing. But to me, to do moves where there's a certainty of injury, I think crosses the line. And I mean, one of the bumps was didn't go exactly as planned, but you know, he he could have been hurt so bad, and he was hurt real bad anyway. So it was like, to me, it's like. I think the art is making it look like you know you're you're hurt when you're not injuring yourself rather than um, you know doing something and, and look what it spawned on like that uh, the WCW pay per view you know trying to top it you know it's like to me I don't know I don't find that wrestling where a guy you know sets himself on fire and jumps off a forty foot thing into an air mattress <laughs> it's, it's a movie stunt you know right right. And you're right. It's a matter of making that illusion that that the guy is more hurt than he really is, you know. And and you putting yourself in situations like that. Sometimes I think guys get a little bit over the edge, and they 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 become they put them in a dangerous situation where they can't turn back, and they got to continue to try to outdo what they did before. Uh, I don't think that's a very uh, very good approach to have a long career in such a great you know way of entertainment so you definitely have to protect yourself and 
you never want to stick your neck out too far because then you find yourself never coming back. And I think that's that's uh, what some people have done in the past. And and you know you, you got to remember these people not only want to see how impressive your your wrestling moves or stunts that you do, but they want to continue to get to know your character. They want to continue to see what direction you're heading. And if you're not there for the next five or ten years, you know, these people will never see who you are because you, you went and tried to do all these crazy things and you end up messing yourself up. So I think you can go to a certain degree, but you don't want to go too far. Mm. And, um, Anything else, Fred? Okay. Can I get one thing just for my brother? Hello. You better ask what it is, because I, I okay. <laughs> no, 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 no open-ended questions. <laughs> okay. Um, my brother wants you to say it's true. It's true. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I knew that was it. I knew that's yeah. what it was. You knew that. You want me hey, to I, say I, I, it? You, you don't have to. <laughs> no. I, what the heck? Uh -oh. You know. I'm, I'm, I'm Kurt Angle, your Olympic hero, the, a man of intensity, integrity, and intelligence. It's right. true. It's true. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. All right. Actually, you were talking one time about uh, WWF guys that you thought might have been really good amateurs but never really did it. You know, I just I, that's funny you say that because we just got done talking about that. Um, Chris Benoit would have been phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Bob Holly, another one that would have been an incredible wrestler. Uh, another one that's a real big surprise, but I've seen him move in the ring, is Bubba Ray Dudley. Very aggressive, very quick, good hips, and it's just a matter of hip power and explosion. And these guys, uh, and work ethic. You know, Chris Benoit and Bob Holly might be the two hardest trainers. When you see him in those two in the gym, you'd be amazed at what they do. And, uh, it definitely keeps them young, but uh, it amazes me because I don't do that stuff anymore. I mean, I used to train like a madman eight hours a day. Now I do more, you know, training for appearance than I do for power and explosion and stuff like that. And uh, I'd have to say those three guys would be really, really good amateur wrestlers. I got a question about two guys as far as perhaps amateur wrestlers, and one's Ken Shamrock and the other's uh, The Big Show. Uh -huh. Just because of the just because of the massive size. Oh, I, I think he, the Big Show. Big Show would have been a phenomenal wrestler too, but he he chose basketball. I heard he was pretty decent too. Uh, on the Kenny high school Shamrock level, he was... used to wrestle. Did you know Kenny was an amateur? Oh yeah, you know he was a really good he was a really really good high school wrestler out yeah. here. But then he never he never wrestled college. No, he he actually tried out in the '88 Olympics, which you never see anyone do is basically wrestle in high school, skip whatever it was. I think it was about six years, come back and train for the Olympics, but. Uh, Kenny tried out, and uh, he just wanted to do it once. Uh, he didn't have a lot of success, but, you know, th that's what I'm talking about. Kenny is the kind of guy that um, he's a jack of all trades. He knows every discipline, and that's what makes him so dangerous in, uh, in the ultimate fighting is he knows how to wrestle. He knows how to, how to defend wrestlers. He knows jiu-jitsu. He knows kickboxing. He knows boxing. He knows karate. This guy knows everything, and that's what makes him so effective in ultimate fighting. Have, have you ever thought about like uh, ways you might have to tweak your character a little bit, or if you think you would have to to, to be at the you know if you were at that the top top level? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, the one thing we've done with my character, and we might have pushed it a little bit too far, is we we made it into more of a comedy character. Um, so that's like what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, and we did that on purpose, just to you know. I know that. Vince McMahon wanted me to portray more as a heel, and lately I've been getting a lot of babyface pops. But I think what he wanted to try to do before he really, I think he's going to send me in the in the really really dark heel in, uh, direction. Uh, he wanted people to to appreciate what I do and like me before he sends me in that direction. So I think what we did is we came up with a little more comedy, so people were entertained, and then eventually I'll probably do the Triple H thing and go a little more serious. But uh, he never wants to get rid of Kurt Angle, the character that, you know, where people can laugh a little bit. I think it's a little bit like The Rock, you know. Rock's pretty serious, but he says a couple of things that just, you just have to laugh. And uh, I think that's what they want to do with me. So, uh, you know, I can't complain. I know that uh, whatever direction they take me, it's better in the long run. And uh, I I've been patient up until now, and I'll continue to be patient. Did you ever, um, um, after, after the Olympics or, or, or when the time came when you decided you wanted to go pro, or even now that you are a pro wrestler, ever think about or discuss wrestling Japanese style? Oh, yeah. The, uh, I don't know if uh, anyone has told you this, but before I started on TV, 
the WWF was going to send me over there. For, 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 the, for the one of the Pride shows or something, or, or a, a Sayana um, show or something? Well, they weren't sure if they were going to send me over for a few weeks or a few months. And you, you never know in, in this kind of entertainment, uh, a few weeks could end up being six, eight months. <laughs> so <laughs> I was heading over there. I think it was FMW. Oh, really? Yeah, which wow. was, uh, from what I heard, was surprising to a lot of people because people surprising. would have thought more all or New Japan uh, would be more, you know, a direction that they'd want to send me. But uh, for some reason, they were thinking FMW, and uh, I was going to head over there. And I would love the work that, you know, guys like Chris Benoit and Eddie, Eddie Guerrero talk about it all the time. They loved it. Chris Jericho, and, you know, they said, Kurt, you would have been great at that. And I would have loved to go over there and experience that, but... Uh, they wanted me to start right away, so here I am. Uh, we've got two contest winners, Adrian Pickworth of Australia and Chris McMurdy of Ontario. The question of what was the highest rated, what was the main event of the highest rated television show, WF television show or any wrestling television show in the United States of the modern era, and the answer is uh, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant from February of 1988 on NBC's live main event. It did a 15.2 rating, which is wow, impressive. Yeah. Yeah. 15.2. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nothing's come close to that. I don't think anything's going to come close to that for, I don't want to say forever, but... Uh, it could possibly that, but it could possibly <laughs> be that. But I think, I think wrestling's still going to go up a little bit, I think. Um, it's... For, it's in, in some, I don't you know, think for everybody. Yeah, not for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's what my... <laughs> You're right about that. Yeah. Uh, let's go to John in Tampa, Florida. John, you're next up. Hey, buddy. John. Hello? Hey. Hey, what's up, Kurt? How you doing? Fine, how are you? Well, I just wanted to say that I don't really think that you're being used as good as you could be in the WWF. I think that you should be in events and stuff. Hello? Uh, I, uh, he, uh, he was just saying that he thinks that you could even be used, uh, he could be used higher in the card. The time will come. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. It's, Kurt is very high considering how much time he's actually spent in sure. wrestling. It's, it's, it's been it's, about it's, seven it's, months. So, um, it's actually I amazing. That, um, I think where I am right now is, is good. Uh, I don't think going up too fast is, is a smart thing. I think uh, building a character and, and working your way up is a lot better. So, you know, I, I know a, a lot of people would, would expect, uh, and not that I deserve to be up there. I, I, I don't think I do yet, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would expect to see like an Olympic champion go straight up and 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 uh, compete for the the belt right away. But uh, that's why Vince is so effective. I think that he he makes sure these people appreciate and like the characters before they they actually see them evolve into uh, main event status. And uh, I think uh, Vince had plans of me, you know, taking my time and and you know, after King of the Ring, I see a lot of things happening. So. Um, I'm real excited about this month. It's going to be a big month for me, and then I just have to take it step by step from there. But uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I can't complain with the with direction they've taken me so far. I think one thing you know that that uh, I that this makes me kind of remember when I first started watching you wrestle in Memphis. Uh -huh. It reminded me a lot of Jack Briscoe, who was a NCAA champion in '65, '66, sure. who then went to pro wrestling and was was one of the, in, the, in the early '70s was probably just about the biggest name in the business sure. as NWA champion. And uh, Jack Briscoe, it took him um, basically three to he was pretty much on the road to the top in three years, and by the fourth year. He was, uh, you know, right up there as the, you know, Dory Funk Jr.'s big challenger when, when they were the top two NWA stars. Right. So, I mean, when we're talking about, like, a guy who's been in wrestling for under two years, uh, you know, remember even, even Briscoe, who was, who was considered, like, a phenomenon coming out of amateur wrestling, it took him pretty much three, four years. So it's not like he's moving slow. I mean, he's going really fast. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. And a lot of people think I'm moving a lot slower than I am, but you're right. It takes time to get there. And there's so many guys that deserve to be up there, and I think you have to earn your keep. And, it, and like you said, it just takes a little more time. Down in Memphis, I enjoyed working down there for the sole fact that I was able to uh, wrestle at least three or four matches per week. As far as character development, they hardly ever let me talk. And obviously, I was a straight-laced baby face, uh, like a 1970 baby face. So there wasn't a real lot they could do with me down there. And uh, I really didn't. 
I wasn't able to show him much of my talent, at least not on, on the microphone and stuff like that. So I wanted to get out of there right away. I actually wanted to develop more uh, where they could um, teach me more on the road, where I would be traveling a lot more and uh, maybe give me opportunities to do uh, promo, uh, promos at house shows and stuff, but uh, they wanted me to stick down there for a while and, and I think get my work working ability, you know, my wrestling ability down before I before I came up. But my 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 character is I'm comfortable with the character and I think that's why I've improved quite a bit because I like it. In my character, the the Kurt Angle in the WWF cracks me up and he excites me because every time I go out there. I'm laughing before the fans are because I can't believe that I'd actually say some of the things that I do. So when you enjoy doing that, you know, and, and you get excited about it, obviously you're going to perform pretty well. And, that, and that's what I have to, give, have to give a lot of credit to the creative guys because they're sending me in a direction that I completely enjoy. You did some work as a sportscaster, right? Yeah, I worked for about eight months as a sportscaster, and the job was pure hell because uh, they never taught me how to do it. They just threw me under, you know, right in the fire. Uh, the first night on the air, I was a sports anchor, and I never had any kind of development. They didn't even, I had no rehearsal. It was just go in there and listen to the anchor, and she'll tell you what to do. And it was like, oh, my gosh. It was, I was like a deer in headlights. And it took me a couple months to adapt, but by the time I got the hang of it, I'd say about three or four months, I actually became quite decent. But uh, I think the progress was so slow that... Um, uh, people didn't accept me as a good sportscaster, and, and I didn't think I was. But then again, you know, I wasn't prepared the right way, and I never did anything like that in college. Uh, I basically got the job because I was an Olympic champion and, and a hometown hero in Pittsburgh, and uh, that's not the right way to get a job. But the money was good, and I didn't want to pass it up, and uh, there I was being a sportscaster in Pittsburgh. But I'll never throw it. I'll never trade it in for the world because I learned a lot. And so uh, like a local sports show? Yeah, it was uh, it was actually a Fox station in Pittsburgh. So it was Fox 53, you know, the the Fox affiliate here in Pittsburgh. Do you think that eight months there has helped you as far as on camera for wrestling? Uh, definitely helped me. But like I said before, when I was up at the WWF, I was more of a I sound more like a sportscaster than I did a, a character, and uh, that's because um, that's what I was taught first thing out of the Olympics. Uh, what's um, Al? Al, what's the the next caller's name? Is it, is it Tony? I'm sorry, Tim. Okay, I'm sorry. It's Tim. Okay, I was just uh, uh, okay. Tim, it's uh, Tim in Chicago. You're next up. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good. Doing real good. Uh, I, don't know, I just want to talk about. I was just me and my friend actually did that at work over at Daniel Foro. We were talking about how like far you've come along and stuff, and uh, it was pretty cool. We also talking about somebody earlier called in with one of your quotes that they liked, and my personal favorite I read over at WrestleWire.com where you were like you had a match with Kane and you. uh you said something like, I'm fighting the big red retard tonight, and not that I have anything against retarded people, because I don't. As a matter of fact, I have a lot of retarded fans out there. <laughs> that was pretty that, funny. That love and appreciate their Olympic one. hero. Oh, God. I remember that. Uh, and then, oh, I do have to admit, uh, Vince McMahon was not real happy with that one. Oh, really? No, oh. no, he wasn't happy. That was something that uh, my creative guy came up with, and... Uh, he brought it to Vince right before Vince was going out. Vince was actually preparing for something, and Vince wasn't quite, uh, his mind wasn't quite into it. So when Brian brought it to his attention, Vince said, sure, sure, go ahead. And uh, when I went out and he, and he was watching on TV, he was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so when I got backstage, he said, hey, uh, let's stay away from that stuff, all right? And I said, okay. I, I you didn't know. know. What, you know what's funny is, is when, when, you, when you said that, I was I had like a split like feeling on that because the first one was like oh I, I mean I see where Vince McMahon's coming and the other one was well it's right out of something about Mary which was you know a hit not all that much earlier than that and it's like you know what I'm saying oh yeah oh yeah I yeah. know what you're saying and uh, I didn't feel real comfortable doing it but you know it, when he said Vince said okay uh, I thought alright go out there and do it because I trust Vince completely and if he has me say something Ooh. I know there's a reason for it and you know Vince is a very organized guy that, that he knows what direction he wants to take you. And he his impulse is so fast, he knows what's right and wrong before it happens. I mean, he, he could tell you, um, like, let's say I'm doing a, a, a commentary uh, with uh, Jim Ross and, and, and uh, Jerry the King, and I'm sitting down, i got the earphones on. He, he is actually, half the time, he's telling you what to say. 
and he is so good at it. Like he, he's actually on the microphone. He, he's the one in your ear that you're listening to. It's Vince. It's not anybody else. And Vince will tell you what to say and and, and when to say it at the right time. And it, it just brings your character out. You don't even know what you're saying half the time. And then when you watch it on TV, you're like, oh, geez, no wonder I said that because Vince was right. I should have been saying that. So Vince is so quick and he's so good at the business that uh, he could play any character he wants. He could play Kurt Angle, Stone Cold himself. He is just a he's a brilliant man that uh, has shown a you know he, he there's no doubt about it. You know he's made a lot of mistakes in his life and he he's admit that he's admitted that. But um, he's learned from those mistakes and and it's made him stronger. It's made this company stronger. And now here he is. Uh, as strong as can be, and he's and he's having a lot of success. I can, you can't disagree with that. No. <laughs> 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 there was a line there about trusting Vince completely. All of a sudden, anyway, no one to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, one other question. Well, with my character, I got to say that he's done nothing but good. Uh, yeah, he has. He has. Anyway, go, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. I was just wondering. I was listening to that. I don't know if you ever listened to it. That garbage WCW live show. I never listen to it, but I do hear about it every every so often. Yeah, it was like, I was like listening to it last night, and uh, after Thunder, like the, one of the worst Thunders ever, probably. And uh, I don't know, whenever they call in that moron, fat ass Bob Ryder, he'll just be like, he'll if you no no seriously, 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 you can d disagree with Bob Ryder, but don't no no fat jokes or ball jokes or anything like that. Right, I mean, so, and I, I don't mean to say that. I just you know let's keep it keep it civil. Oh, all right, but you can well, say whatever you want about him. I don't care. All right, but if anybody calls as long as you don't say anything bad about him, per, his personal life, right, nothing, that, that. nothing in that direction either. Okay, right. go ahead. But, I don't know. If somebody calls in and they complain about something that happens or anything, that he's just like, okay, and then they'll click the guy off. They're nothing. They're, I don't know. I just hate that show. They're not. They're not open like about things like you guys are and stuff. Well, uh, you know, they're they're in a bad they're in they're in a bad position right now. I mean, it, it, it's you know the product's not doing very well, and they have to defend it and. You know, they it, it, it's it's tough. I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm not in their shoes. I'll tell you that. Mm. Not that I condone anything they do. <laughs> Who are you talking about? Uh, the WCW Live uh, crew. Oh. Yeah. So I just don't want to get to their I don't want to get to their level where it becomes you know us baiting them or anything like that. Sure. But, but, sure. You know. So anyway. All right. Thanks for the time. Okay. Let's All go right. to Jamie. Jamie, you're next. Hi, Kurt. How you doing? How you doing? Pretty good. Um, I have. A couple of questions. Um, the first one: What would be a typical day? Um, like, how many hours do you work out, and how many meals do you usually eat a day? Did you hear that? Yeah, I think he said something about how many hours I work out a day. How how many hours you work out, and how many meals you eat a day? Okay, I, I eat about ten meals a day. Seriously? And, yeah, and I work out between an hour and a half and two hours a day, which is way down from my Olympic training, which was eight hours a day. Um, yeah, I, I eat from the time I get up which is about 8 a.m. until midnight uh, every two hours. So 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. A lot of options. Nine here. or ten times. Do you do like like, like, uh, like bars or something, or do you pre-prepare pre pre food when you're going on the road? A little bit of both. When I'm on the road, um, that's where, you know, you have to suck it up. and you, I bring a lot of whey protein. I don't like eating a lot of bars because, let's face it, most of the protein bars out there, they're basically proteined up candy bars. And uh, so you have to watch what you're eating on the road, and it's really hard to do. But I try to eat three or four times a day on the road at restaurants, uh, at particular restaurants. I try to find good ones, and, and they're hard to find. But uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm taking my whey protein with me. And I, and I usually have probably six or seven shakes a day. Are you pretty like uh, disciplined as far as on the road, as far as junk food, alcohol, things like that? Or? I don't drink at all. Uh, uh, I when I'm on the road, I eat as strictly as I can. When I come home, I relax a little bit more. And, and the reason why is because I'm not home all that much. So when I come home, I try to enjoy my time with my wife, and and we we let loose a little bit. You know, eat eat some sweets and that stuff like that. That's about as crazy as we get here in Pittsburgh. But, um, uh, yeah, I stay away from the booze, and I, I pretty much I try to get as much sleep as I can on the road because it's grueling. When you're on the road five days, six days a week, uh, especially the way it is right now, uh, you know, you, 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 gotta, you have to get your right amount of rest or you're going to be screwed. Okay, let's go to, uh, let's go to Masad. You, you'll be our last caller today. Hi, guys. Um, I've got a question for... Uh, for Kurt, um, you remember your uh, your entrance at the Survivor Series, and uh, everyone was booing you. And you went on you went on the microphone. And you said you do not boo an, an American gold medalist. Uh huh. 
Were you going in there expecting booze and uh, that in your mind, or was that just spontaneous? Okay, this is where we straight shoot. Um, well, at uh, Survivor Series, uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I was scared to death. I mean, that was my first match on TV. And I went out there. I was in Detroit at the Joe Louis Arena. And I went out there, and the fans booed me. So I was like, oh, heck, which, which direction is Vince going? Because Vince wasn't clear on uh, which direction I was going. He didn't tell me that uh, I was going to be a babyface or a heel. He just basically said, go out there and have a good match. So I went out, had a good match, and here uh, Stasiak's getting the better of me, puts me in a rest hold where he's kind of choking me out, and the referee comes up to me and said, Vince said, go over to the microphone, and you tell these people do not boo an Olympic champion. You do not boo an Olympic champion. I looked up at the ref, and I said, you're serious, right? He said, I'm as serious as I can get. Go over. He said, take over right now. Go over. Grab that microphone, and you go off on those people. So I did it. And what happened? The fans really got into me. I mean, they were like, you suck, Angle. And all of a sudden, they were booing me as much as they could. And Vince Vince picked it. You know, he he uh, did it at the right time. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is Vince is real good at timing. And... Uh, he, his impulses are so fast, and he just knows when the right thing, what the right thing to do. I don't know if anyone knows this, but Vince is up in the in the stage in the gorilla we call it, where 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 you you have conversation with the with the commentators and the officials. And Vince pretty much is up there running most of the show. Uh, the guy works hard, and and he makes a lot of good decisions. And uh, he definitely made the right one with me my first night. And from then on, I just listened to whatever he had to say, and he told me what what to say when I went out there, and it worked. Quick Anything question. else, Saad? Yeah, quick question for Dave. Uh, um, what's the chance of getting Hogan on? All of us want to want to give him a piece of our mind. Hogan? Hogan? Yeah. Hogan? I I don't I don't think very good. <laughs> Do you want? I mean, to? what? Do you want to get him on? Hogan? I mean, pretty much anyone at that we caliber. Would need a longer show. Yeah, we would. But if, if anyone of that caliber, if they if they if they want to do the show, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no, you know, or anything like that. Just to you know, but I I don't expect that he would do the show. That's, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I wouldn't expect it. I mean, it's per, certainly not right now. It's it's gonna be hard enough for anyone from WCW. But but um, who knows? I mean, I would never say never. Though I, I, if this show's on long enough, probably like in ten years, Hogan probably would do it. <laughs> Uh, and do it guys. well. <laughs> it would be quite. That would be quite the show. Yeah, then we'll need a four-hour show. <laughs> At least. Ten more years to talk about. What? Oh, talking more, about that ten whole. Ten more years on top to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know he's going to be around because him and Nicholas have to be a tag team. That's right. They already established that. So that's uh, how old's Nicholas now? His son. I have no idea. Well, it's, it's probably ten, ten-ish. So, so we got at least ten more years of him on top. <laughs> oh God. Kurt, I want to thank you very much for uh, for doing the show. We're pretty hey, much thank you. At a time, and I want to wish you the best of luck, and I hope that uh, at the Survivor Series everything goes a- a- exactly as uh, you're looking for, because it sounds like you're pretty excited about that show. I mean, not Survivor Series, King, King of the Ring. King of the Ring, there you go. Yeah, Survivor yeah, Series. Yeah, I'm real excited, and I hope, I hope everything goes the way it's planned, and uh, hopefully uh, things will work out the, the way I explain them. <laughs> but um, yeah. I-, I thank you guys for having me on. Anytime you want me on, let me know. Okay, great. We would love to have you on again. And I want to tell everyone, don't forget, uh, we're going to have Frank Shamrock on Friday and Jim Cornette on Monday, and we'll see you tomorrow at 6.